will hurt you. And when we've got that done, we'll start checking your feet, all right? Okay. You've been awfully good. Everything's going fine. We'll go through now a series where you can count backward from 10 to 1. If you have any trouble, we'll ask you about it afterward, all right? Okay. Just try it now. Would you just to run through? 10, 9, It's eight, called the Montreal seven, Procedure. Six, five, They're operating four, on the brain. Three, the two, patient is awake. One. Very good. All right, again, please. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. They're looking three, for something. Two, one. The surgeon today is Dr. William Feindel. His patient has epilepsy. Okay, again, please. Electric storms sweep across her brain. They make her fall and wet herself. They make her arms and legs thrash about. It terrifies her. All right, now start at Wednesday and say them backwards, please. Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, Sunday, Saturday, Friday, Thursday. Again, please, start at Wednesday. Wednesday Dr. Feindel is looking for the source Sunday, of her fits. Friday, he and his team will be here for 12 Thursday, hours right, without a break. Okay. Could we put it up to two volts then? <coughs> Just say days of the week backwards at one and a half volts, covering the area, no mistake. Two volts now. Like many surgeons, Dr. Feindel learned this operation right here in the Montreal Neurological Institute. His teacher was the man who built this institute and pioneered the operation. A man who in his time was called the greatest living Canadian, Dr. Wilder Penfield. It took a lot of faith in yourself in 1921 when he began. They knew so little then. Another patient died today, a baby, on whom I had operated three times already. Brain surgery is a terrible profession. If I did not feel it will become very different in my lifetime, I should hate it. Neurosurgical work was very new at that time. And of course, it was running into the usual uh, difficulty of acceptance of any new technique. A lot of it quite justified because, of course, the mortality, the post-operative mortality, was very high. Dr. Uh, William Feindel. The amount that you could do for a patient in those days, neurosurgically, was very limited. And all the neurosurgeons from the turn of the century onward had a pretty difficult time establishing themselves. Penfield revolutionized the study and treatment of the brain. His patients presented him with astonishing revelations that led him on a lifelong search to understand the brain's deepest mysteries. It was 11 years ago that you were here. And you had had, uh, as a little girl, around seven, an illness that left its mark. And so you began to have attacks, which began, I remember you're telling me, with a feeling of fear. Do you remember we studied you with the x-ray, with electrograms, saw the pattern of your attack, and there was only one place it could be, and that's right here, in your right temporal region. And so we opened it up there, didn't we? Yeah. Under local anesthesia. Do you remember the pain? There was no pain. Well, that's good. It's nice of you to say so, anyway. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> and that showed the underlying brain. This is the brain. Now, when we stimulated at three, you had a tingling in your thumb. You've probably forgotten now. Not very clear. Then, underneath this, we stimulated, and to my astonishment, yes. you said, I hear music. Then I repeated it no. without warning you a little while later. You said, I hear that music again. Tell us what you heard. Well, I heard what sounded like an orchestra playing. And 
I asked the nurse where it was coming from, and she asked me the name of it. But I, I said, I know the song, but I can't think of the name of it. And then I stimulated it again, you remember, and asked you about it, and you hummed it. Will you hum it now, you remember? Yes. Go ahead. Da, 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 Yes, and then when you got to that point, Miss, the nurse exclaimed, I know what it is, it's rolling along together. And you said what? And I said, yes, that's what it is. <laughs> One of the most obvious things about Dr. Penfield was the feeling that here's a, a different kind of a man who has a great mission in life. He didn't mince words, and... Uh, and he was utterly convinced he was right. I think he uh, felt that he was led by higher powers. Um, I'm not saying that he heard God talking to him, but I think he felt he was getting his instructions from at least as reliable sources as that. He had a perfectly delightful, to me, naivete. Cynicism was far removed from him. And in spite of his greatness as a surgeon and a scientist and an organizer. Right at the heart to the end of his days at Wilder Penfield, there seemed to me to remain an inquiring boy. A famous Canadian doctor? The boy had no thought of becoming a doctor at all. He was born in 1891 and grew up in Wisconsin, in the heartland of the American Middle West child of a middle class as narrow in its outlook as it was firm and righteous in its moral vision. Convinced that by grace and by God, America had been chosen to lead the world. A world where a small boy who worked hard and read his Bible could grow up to be anything he liked. In 1909, he left to go to Princeton, determined to become a Rhodes Scholar. In the East, they were sophisticated and could teach him how to become a man of the world. Dear Mother, they asked us not to write home about forcing until it was all over. But I know you won't kick about the rough handling your darling little son gets, so I write anyway. It's all right. Dear Mother, Eastern girls certainly deserve the prize for flirting. Miss King immediately got her eyes into action, telling me she was crazy about me, etc. Eyes like Miss King's usually get what they want, and I'm glad I made no fool of myself. It'll be good to get back to the gym. I've missed it. If I am to make a good tackle, I must accept that the game is a fight, a real fist fight against the man opposite. Catch him in the face a couple of downs running, and he'll let you through the next time, unless he's a better fighter than you. Not a great athlete, he had to fight just to sit on the bench with the freshman team. But by his senior year, he was a star fullback, famous for the Penfield Ricochet, his name and picture in the New York Times. But he wasn't all jock. In more thoughtful moods, he would climb to the top of a college tower to be alone and indulge a streak of lofty romanticism. I fancied I was seeing the towers of the arts and sciences in a dreamlike city of the intellect. There was so much to learn there, and beyond the learning, there was truth, unguessed, and yet to be discovered. He knew that he wanted to be a Rhodes Scholar and go to Oxford, but then what? He drew up a list of professions and one by one crossed them off. Politician, lawyer, minister, even millionaire. In the end, all that was left was doctor. Through a microscope in a biology class, his teacher, Edward Conklin, had opened up a whole world of mysteries. Through medicine, he could explore this world. 
His graduating class voted Wilder Penfield best all-around man and most respected man. But the Rhodes Scholarship went to someone else. I think this is one of the interesting things of, about the man. That many people have said that uh, he was something of a genius, that he was obviously very quick to learn. And the opposite was actually true, and it was, a, for him, a benefit because he knew his limitations, and he knew that he was, as he called it, a slugger. His son, Wilder uh, Penfield, Jr. And he had to plug along at something very hard to do what some people that he knew and envied uh, could do uh, in a flash. Um, and therefore, he had established very early on uh, a habit of working to plan. The plan still called for a Rhodes Scholarship. Next year, the slugger tried again and won. Nineteen fifteen was not a good year to go to Oxford. On the plains of western France, Europe was bleeding to death, and the students of Oxford were joining the rush to the trenches. Wilder was one of the handful of foreign students who took their place. America was neutral, but the empty quadrangles were still a bitter reproach to a red-blooded young man. Still, it had its advantages. Most of all, a chance to get to know one of his teachers, Sir William Osler. A Canadian doctor with a worldwide reputation, Osler was the perfect model for a young medical student. Penfield learned from Osler that medicine was much more than just healing bodies. Being a doctor was a high and noble calling. He is the least sentimental and the most helpful man I've ever seen. If I were not so dumb, I should have the nerve to hope and dream I might follow in his footsteps. After a year, Wilder grew tired of watching the war from the sidelines. During term break, he set off for France. He never made it. I thought to myself, this is the end. I'm falling into the sea. And then conviction came to me like a flash. This cannot be the end. My work in the world has only just begun. Seconds before the bow broke off and sank, he crawled astern, his left leg badly shattered. He was convinced that he had been saved for some great purpose. Penfield headed back to America to finish his studies at Johns Hopkins Medical School. There he watched the surgeons at work and decided that surgery was the place for him. It's nothing but skilled carpentry work with a lot of daring, knowledge of anatomy, pathology, and judgment. I'm glad I've done some carpentry. The rest must be hammered out. But he had not gone into medicine to be just a surgeon. At Oxford, he had studied under Sir Charles Sherrington, doing pioneering experiments on the brains of animals. Wilder's imagination had been sparked. The brain was the seat of the soul. There, if anywhere, life's ultimate secrets would be uncovered. And Sherrington was an inspiring teacher. I looked at the world through his eyes and came to realize that here in the brain and the nervous system was the great unexplored field, the undiscovered country in which the mystery of the mind might someday be explained. It seemed there was only one place for him, brain surgery. He went to Boston to work with Harvey Cushing. Cushing was the most successful neurosurgeon in the world, but even he lost more patients than he saved. The workings of the brain were still a great puzzle, and the surgeon's work was mostly trial and error. As he watched Cushing, Penfield began to feel that if he had a mission in life, as he so firmly believed, Perhaps it was to be the one to unlock the brain's secrets. If they could understand it, they could mend it. Penfield set out to find a way to combine surgery with scientific investigation. In 
In Germany, a brain surgeon named Ottfried Furster was operating on once hopeless epilepsy cases with encouraging results. Thousands of men had returned from World War I with head injuries. A large proportion were developing epilepsy. Little was known about this ancient disease, and it seemed to Penfield a fruitful area for studying the brain. He went to Germany and from Furster learned what he needed to specialize in epilepsy surgery. In the hospital in New York where he practiced, Penfield found the first convert to his radical ideas. Bill Cohn, a bright young pathologist who wanted to learn neurosurgery. Together, they set out to bring science into the operating room. But in the New York medical world, they were junior surgeons. They got the charity cases. The senior surgeons got the rich patients, the ones whose gratitude often meant generous donations for research. Penfield and Cohn plugged on, but it became clearer and clearer that New York was not the place for their ambitious plans. Far to the north was Montreal, a city with an internationally famous medical community, but no full-time brain surgeon. The only one in Canada had set up in Toronto. Montreal's pride could not accept that. The Royal Victoria Hospital went shopping in New York and found Wilder Penfield. They liked his ambitious ideas. He liked the opportunity they offered. The deal was struck. In 1928, with his assistant, Bill Cohn, he left for Montreal with high hopes. They had hardly settled in the Royal Victoria when Wilder had to face a terrible decision. His sister, Ruth, was dying and she had come to him. Since childhood, she'd had headaches and convulsions. Now x-rays showed a massive tumor. Only radical surgery could save her. There was no time to lose, but she was his own sister. We could probably have taken her to Cushing or to someone else and got her there before she went blind. But I decided to undertake the operation myself because I was afraid another surgeon might turn back too soon, not knowing how much she had to live for. One of the nurses was Kathleen Greer. The patient was wheeled in, and uh, we put the sterile sheets on, and uh, she asked if he, she could talk to Dr. Penfield, and he said, you can for a little while, but I'll tell you when you get to finish. It was a very trying day, because we knew it was his sister he was operating on. There was a lot of tension, as there would be. All day there seemed to be tension, especially when he got down to the tumor and uh, didn't know exactly whether to take it all out or not. It extended underneath, gray, firm, malignant-looking tissue on the floor of the skull with enormous veins coming up through it. This was already the largest brain removal I had ever made. But to my dismay, the growth was not all out, and the discovery filled me with a sort of frenzy, and I fear I was rather reckless. For about 15 minutes, I couldn't carry on, and my assistant, Dr. Cohn, had to take over. When he had done all he could, he stopped, and they closed her up. But he had done what no one else would have dared, and cut away most of her frontal lobe. How much would she be changed? Up until that time, the frontal lobe had a rather vague identification in terms of its function. What does the frontal lobe do? Here's this large part of the brain. You can take it out, and which he did in his sister, and really she was remarkably normal, except that when he went to visit her later on, 
he was staying for dinner and he realized that she wasn't planning the dinner. There were pots and pans and things on the, the stove and the dessert was uh, not ready and she didn't have the sequence which any good housewife would, would have developed. And it was a rather practical example which he immediately uh, uh, perceived as what we know now is related to frontal lobe function, that is the sort of planned initiative, that is organizing something ahead of time so that it comes together. And she lacked this because of the lack of the frontal lobe uh, function. And the tumor was growing back. Two years later, it killed her as her brother stood by, helpless. But he still had the wit and the scientific interest to make a, an important observation, which has come down to us uh, and given us another glimpse of this uh, remarkably complex thing we carry around inside our skulls. In the first years in Montreal, they were just a small group, too small for Wilder Penfield and his plan. In his desk drawer was a sketch for a whole institute where surgeons and scientists, French and English, could work side by side in the search for cures for diseases like the one that had killed his sister. But the plan would cost millions, and this was the depression. After Paris, Montreal was the second largest French city in the world. But Montreal was controlled by a tight clan of rich and powerful men, the Scottish merchant princes. From their office fortresses, they ran their empires. The railroads, the banks, the mines, the newspapers. They had built the Royal Victoria Hospital in the image of a Highland castle. Now they could help build his institute. He painted them a picture of a hospital that would make their city a world center for brain research and be a lasting monument to their power and wealth. With a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation and support from the city and provincial governments, it was a vision the citizens of Montreal could not refuse. From roof peak to foundation stone, he fought over every detail. The mark of Wilder Penfield was everywhere. Carved into the walls, his fascination with history, the primitive instruments of early neurosurgeons, and the homilies by which he guided his life. He made it a temple to science and the brain. The foyer was the centerpiece. Lamps, floor tiles, tables, even the radiator grills were patterned on the complex structures of the brain and the nervous system. On the ceiling, Ares the Ram, ringed by a quote from the second century physician Galen, but I have seen a wounded brain heal. And around this, a pattern of brain cells. His heroes, the great medical and scientific pioneers. Most important of all, a copy he had commissioned of a statue in Paris, nature unveiling before science. It was a promise he intended to keep. In 1934, the Montreal Neurological Institute opened, and Wilder Penfield, now 43 years old, became a Canadian citizen. From the French and English medical communities, he began to gather his team. Among the early arrivals was an American, Herbert Jasper. To find a clinical man, a neurosurgeon, interested in pure science was a little bit unusual. Most clinicians were interested in scientific questions if they'll help them with their neurosurgery. You know, if they'll help them treat patients, it's okay to be scientific, but science just for itself you know, it's a waste of time. Most clinicians, many clinicians would feel that way. So to get in an environment where the clinicians here were also interested in pure science, whether or not 
it helped them at the right at that moment to treat patients. That was an exciting experience. And, and uh, of course, it was his personality and his character and his, he was a lovable fellow, you know. And <laughs> All roads at the Institute led to his operating room and the epilepsy operation that would become known around the world as the Montreal Procedure. Well, the development of the surgical operation on the brain under local anesthesia with the patient still awake and able to respond was based on the fact that it was necessary very often to map out the vital areas on the surface of the brain, such as those that control the hand or vision or particularly speech uh, in order to protect those areas during the surgical removal of scar tissue which was causing the patient epilepsy or a tumor which may have been triggering off an epileptic seizure for the patient. To map out the vital areas of the brain, the surgeon touched the surface with a gentle electric probe. By observing the patient's reaction, he could tell which part of the body was controlled by that spot on the brain. Touch there, and perhaps a hand would move. There, a leg. There, he might see stars. The probing mapped the brain, but it also helped the surgeon locate the spot where the epileptic fits began. If a patient had a seizure, for example, which began with a certain sensation, let's say, he felt a tingling in his ear. That started every attack, that's the aura. But if you didn't know where the ear was represented in the brain, it, it wouldn't help you very much because you'd have to know where that ear was represented in order to remove the focus, you see. Now? No. And now? No. And now? Sometimes the sensation that accompanied the fit uh -huh. was not so straightforward. They were very complex things. Patient would, would see a man coming out of the woods and grabbing her around the neck or something like that. That was always the beginning of her attack. She was frightened. Well, where is that located? You see, in the brain. So we had to study not only these simple things like sensation, but we had to find out where complex things were located, where we looked for them too. That was uh, one and a half years. Herbert Jasper's first contribution was the electroencephalograph an innovation that made the search a great deal more scientific. Electrodes on the brain picked up its electrical activity and read it out on a graph. Epileptic discharge showed up on the graph as spiky waves. When the surgeon had tracked down the source and removed it, the epileptic fits often stopped. The patient was cured. <laughs>